You're listening to the Real Estate Entrepreneur Podcast with Terrence Murphy, where we cover sales, investing, and entrepreneurship with an emphasis on real estate. Each podcast, Terrence and his guests will bring you informative and inspiring information within the real estate industry. Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Entrepreneur with Terrence Murphy. I have a quote that I'll start out with, this one's short, and it says, everyone looks at the cost of a book, a course, or a coach, but nobody considers the cost of being in the same place one year from now. Make sure you understand what you're putting in yourself, the information and the people you're around, and don't be in the same place you were last year. But my guest is Tom. I call him Tom. We got Thomas on here, but I call him Tom. We uh, did some real estate together in the past. I was impressed by his professionalism, his consistency, and uh, welcome to the show, brother. Derek, it's good to see you again. appreciate you reaching out. And we did a deal not only uh, in the past, but during interesting times and appreciate the way you handled yourself through the transaction as well. Surprisingly, we were able to get it closed with a couple of concessions and things that worked out for both sides. So good to work with you. Yeah, we got it done, man. So just tell me a little bit about yourself. Obviously, this is the real estate entrepreneur. And so I'll say whether you're a broker, developer, you know, hotel, multifamily, we're all real estate entrepreneurs. But tell me your story, man, and how did you get into commercial real estate? Okay, thanks. Yeah, I grew up in Chicago. I ended up in Denver, Colorado, going to the University of Denver. So once I landed here, like most people, decided to stay. I got into the private side of real estate doing underwriting for a mobile home company called Affordable Residential Communities helping them acquire mobile home parks throughout the country. And so we were buying properties to put into our portfolio to run through different districts throughout the country. We had a large footprint in Dallas, Florida, Colorado, Wyoming, up and down the East Coast. So cut my teeth figuring out the analytical side, doing underwriting for that company, and then got a little bit burnt out. We went public. It turned into American residential communities and just started to be more of kind of the day-to-day acquisition side of it rather than the entrepreneurial side when it was a private company really kind of firing all cylinders looking to buy property. So decided to get out of that, did a little bit of finance work, and then got back into the brokerage company, the brokerage world here in Denver with a company called Pinnacle Real Estate Advisors. Did that for about 10 years and then decided. It was time to turn the page again and started our own brokerage company called Blue West Capital. We focused in net lease investments, what we call private capital, which is two to $20 million. Our target clients are high net worth individuals, private real estate companies, you know, people exchanging in and out of different properties. So it kind of gets back to that entrepreneurial side where we get to connect with the clients. They're usually, you know, fun to work with. They've got some kind of investment strategy that they're trying to accomplish that we can help with. So Denver's been a good place to do business. Colorado's ever expanding. So uh, staying busy and enjoying our world in the commercial real estate business. Love it, bro. Love it. So when you talk about obviously Blue West Capital, are you guys just a brokerage house or are you, are you also doing the deals, the developer kind of walk me through and what was your thought process when you decided to start your own shop? Absolutely. So Blue West Capital is hundred percent an investment brokerage company. We don't do any development. We do a lot of work with developers who are building retail shopping centers, net lease investments, industrial flex, a little bit of office, but mostly retail and industrial. So we don't do any ownership. We don't do any development. We just help people figure out, you know, what their assets worth, what they should do with it, and then turn into a marketing company to really help them cast as wide as net as we can to find the right one buyer. From what was the second part? What? Why did we start Blue West Capital? Mm-hmm. Yep. So you know, being at Pinnacle, which is a boutique brokerage firm here in Denver for 10 years, we really saw the synergies of the office. We liked working with the CVREs of the world, the JLLs, which have some advantages for different brokers and the, the path that they're going down. Our client base being more of the entrepreneurial high net worth individual. My business partner and I decided we wanted to to really grow our brokerage team 
an inside of a company that was existing that didn't really make sense for us for a couple of different reasons. And so took the plunge, lifted our team outside of Pinnacle, spread our wings, started Blue Us Capital and implemented a lot of the things that we wanted from a collaborative database, different marketing techniques, website tracking stuff in order to really help service our clients and attract new business. So it just made sense. It was a good time for us to kind of jump out and spread our wings and start our own company. Love it, man. A good a time as any, I guess, you know, there's never, never a perfect time, but it worked well. Yeah. And that's one of the things I always say on the show, you know, if you look up the meaning of entrepreneur, it's someone who's willing to put up more money or put up their own money to take more than normal risk. And so you're an entrepreneur, you're going to take risks no matter what you start, you know? So that's, that's big. Yeah. So one of the questions that I always get, and there's, there's a couple of questions we're going to jump into, but one is how to underwrite a property. And I know you have a background in that. If we were going to break this down in bite-sized pieces through a five-step, 10-step, 15-step process, whatever in your mind, how, how would you, if you were telling me as a brand new broker or a new investor, how do I underwrite a property? What are those phases in the underwriting process that I want to make sure I hit, you know? Yeah. So I think collecting the correct information is always important. Trying to figure out what are expenses for the property, not only going forward, but going backwards. What's the the rent collection look like? Not only going backwards, but going forwards trying to really figure out the key metrics of occupancy, vacancy, rental rate, stuff like that. Depending on the deal size, you know, you can get as simple or complicated as you want. And sometimes you kind of end up at the same point, just kind of, you know, figuring out very quickly, you know, what's the net NOI, put a little vacancy factor on it, cap it and get to a value. You know, you can do that in about 10, 15 seconds, or you can put it into a 10 year cash flow with all kinds of lease renewal assumptions, vacancy assumptions, TIs, you know, cost of capital refinancing and, and dig into the weeds. And it really depends on the individual, the investor and what they're looking to present. And so, you know, we work with developers that are building $50 million regional centers with all kinds of out parcels. And you look at their underwriting and it's a simple one pager where if it checks out with, you know, here's what my rents are going to be, here's what my costs are going to be. And if I hit a certain threshold, let's do the deal where, where other people really want, you know, a 10 year cash flow to figure out all the inputs and what's going to happen in the market. You know, assumptions, assumptions can be tricky. And it depends on if you're a long-term holder or a developer looking to flip out and go on to your next project, what kind of your, your wants are for the underwriting. So, you know, it's uh, uh, like many answers in real estate, it kind of depends on what your end goal is. And I'd say certain scenarios, keep it simple, quick, and try and figure out what the valuation is on a, on a back of a napkin and other scenarios. You know, they've got software like Argus and Excel that you can get pretty detailed and, and, and include all kinds of different assumptions, but the end result only is good as the assumptions that you put into it. So you also kind of keep that in mind of where am I getting my data from and what am I putting into my model to get to the end result? Love it. Love it. So when you, now that, if, now that we know, okay, we did some basic underwriting, let's kind of shift to if I'm a developer and obviously, I know, you know, you and I know we know the answers, but I'm just thinking for my audience. What about a developer, right? So there's a piece of dirt, like a basic kind of back of the napkin. What is a developer looking for when they're going to go and do an out parcel or a strip center or bring in a Starbucks or whatever? What are they looking for numbers wise? Obviously, they're, you know, they're getting a bid on their cost, but is there certain margins that they're hitting? Is there certain return on investment metrics? like? What are they looking for right now in this current market or even the market before, you know, COVID? Yeah, it's gotten a lot tighter. And so every developer is a little bit different. If they're a larger developer working with a national retailer, Starbucks, 7-Eleven, 
where they're going to be doing 50 of these, you know, they might be doing them for a little bit less margin, where if it's a one-off developer that is only going to do one or two a year, they might, they might really try and, and, and get a little bit larger of a spread. And, you know, in LA might be different than Denver it might be different from Omaha, Nebraska, just from a demographic and a risk perspective. I would say the, the, the average rule that we hear is you've got a, an average cost to build, and then you've got a cost that the market will pay for it. And the spread there needs to be about 150 basis points, give or take. Some scenarios, it could go down to 100. Some scenarios, it could go up to 200 if it's, if it's got a lot more risk associated with it. But, but right in that kind of 150 basis point spread, is where a lot of developers or owners or value add guys might try and be. And so what that means is if I'm going to build a multi-tenant retail center in front of a Walmart, let's say, fully loaded costs, land, soft cost taps, architectural engineering, all of that, plus my hard costs of building construction, TIs, landlord deliveries, I'd want to build it to about a seven and a half cap if I thought the market for that was about a six. So in order to take all the risk, all the time, you, know, you got 18 months to two years of no revenue. So to make up for all of that downtime risk and work, you probably need about 150 basis point spread. Otherwise yeah, yeah. the project's not worth it. Yeah, so you need to be 1.50 or more on the cap spread. Yeah. Right? Yep. yep. That's great. That's a lot. Of, that's really good wisdom there, guys. And what 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 is a cap rate? So when people hear basis points, cap rates, TI, yeah. t, you know, tenant, I mean, we, you and I tenant incentives and all these different things. But what is a cap rate and what is a basis point? Cap rate is one of those things that gets, you know, taught in business school and real estate school. And then when people hear it, they kind of freeze in the headlights of like, well, I'm not really sure. And so, you know, you can think of cap rate more or less of just your return on your investment, just like a savings account. And so if you had a million dollars in a savings account and received a 10% return on it, you'd get $100,000 out of it per year. If, if you got a 5% return, you'd get 50 grand. And so reverse that and call it a cap rate. If the net operating income from a property is hundred thousand dollars and it's a 10 cap that's worth a million dollars if the noi is 50 grand and it's a five cap the value is a million dollars and so it's really just a down and dirty valuation of a property's net operating income to figure out the value it's like a, a rate of return on the property's income and so a 10 cap would be 10 years of income a five cap would be 20 years of income. It's just more, more or less a, a return now that some of the things you said at your end of your question are kind of below the line of NOI. Like it doesn't include debt. It doesn't include capital expense items like TIs and leasing commissions and stuff like that. So you always want to be a little bit careful of, of what income you're capping to figure out your value. Does it have a vacancy factor in it? Does it have a TI number in it? Does it have a capital expense number in it? And those are always negotiated and argued by buyer and seller. Seller thinks there shouldn't be any of those in there, and a buyer thinks that all of those should be in there. So that's kind of the more more of the process of the deal is kind of what underwriting is real and and who's going to believe what. Yeah, and that gets tricky on those deals for sure, because really underwriting also is someone's opinion. That's the that's the one piece we leave out of the conversation. You know, like you said, there's assumptions included and everybody's assumptions. Some people are a little more aggressive. Some people aren't as aggressive, especially in the multifamily space, because it's a lot of assumptions versus commercial space. A lot of the leases and the renewals are already done. But, yep, absolutely. You know, but multifamily, it's a lot of assuming and assumptions for sure. And we do some multifamily work. And the tricky part is you look at you look at current versus pro forma and a lot of people blend the two a little bit of because the leases are only 12 months at, at a time, you might have 25% of your building renewing in the next three to four months. And so the underwriter will take 
whatever the highest leases were that were signed recently and kind of flow those through the entire rent roll, which in commercial, if you've got a fully leased building, you're usually taking more of the in-place income or the in-place leases to try and figure out the NOI or the value. Mm -hmm. So what's one lesson that you learned that you know now that you wish you would have known when you got into this space? Like if you said, dude, if I could go back to my younger self, this is the one nugget that I would tell myself. What would that be? From a broker's standpoint, you know, just, I, I guess the nugget of information I would tell myself is, you know, don't be afraid of the no. Just continue in, in a brokerage role for the right person. We, we offer a great service of, of helping them figure out value or helping them figure out marketing or, or what their asset is, you know, 50% of our time is helping with asset management of what should I do with this leases? I'm trying to renegotiate debt or I'm trying to help with that. And so with any sales concept, you know, you bump into a lot of people that might've been rubbed the wrong way or, or not interested for whatever reason in the past. And that can be discouraging. And I'd say the overarching lesson and the constant lesson I would tell my younger self is come up with a business plan, call for a reason and stay the course. Don't let people discourage you. Love it. Love it. A couple more thoughts. So you, we talked a little bit about retail. What sets apart the office investment versus industrial? Is there a different type of evaluation or demographic that's investing in these different, you know, kind of asset classes? Do they all kind of blend together? Just kind of give me an overarching perspective on retail versus office versus industrial. One, you know, location, location, location comes into play with retail more so, I'd say, than any of those. If you're a retailer like Chick fil A, Starbucks, In and Out Burger, you know, Dutch Brothers, you really do need access, visibility, parking, synergies with Whole Foods, King, whoever your, you know, local grocery store is. And so there's a lot of fundamentals in retail that really come into play where, if you're an office tenant looking for 10,000 square feet and I show you, you know, five different office buildings in downtown Denver or wherever you're hosting the podcast from, it might be a little bit more about cost or amenities of the building and stuff like that. So I would say from a, from a tenant standpoint, location is very important in retail, a little bit less so in office from an owner standpoint you know, similar type conversations of when you're looking at acquiring retail assets, you really want to be sure, you know, what's, what are my traffic counts? What are my demographics? Who are my synergies? Where are my lease rates? And kind of understanding those retail key metrics or fundamentals. Office is in a funky place right now with kind of the churn of the office space and are people taking more space because they want to be spread out? Are they taking less space because they're downsizing? You know, the TIs and and all of commercial retail included, especially in office space, in order to finish out an office building have jumped probably double. What 20 bucks a foot used to get you three years ago, it's now 40 bucks a foot. Tenants want shorter leases and more TIs, which hurts a landlord. So you got to be really careful of of your un, kind of going back to your underwriting. What's my lease term going to be in the next two to three years? What am I going to have to spend to replace my tenants? And if I, is that going to push me into the negative or is that going to keep me in the, the positive and really, you know, a, a fundamentally good investment? Industrial is kind of ever changing. You know, some industrial buildings are now more expensive than big box retail. So you've seen certain big boxes converted to like Amazon warehouses and self storage and stuff like that because it's cheaper than what is now industrial. And so as the e-commerce scene plays out, as retailers go to omni-channel where they need fulfillment centers close by, industrials kind of blur in the lines. But I think you know, it's it's also somewhat the darling of the industry right now, as well as apartments. Yeah. Um, just because of the rental growth, people believe in the long-term road ahead. And so it's it's attracting a lot of capital, simple supply-demand economics. You got a lot of people chasing the same assets. 
cap rates get pushed down, prices get pushed up. So we like all flavors of commercial real estate. I think, you know, there's value and there's opportunity in all of them. You just got to to figure out kind of an investment strategy of, am I going to be opportunistic? Am I going to be super like category focused where we, we want apartment buildings, 20 to 40 units, and this is the type of construction and this is the location, or if it's got a value add component to it and I can buy it, fix it, flip it or fill it and run it, you know, pick a, pick a road to go down and, and go for it really. Yeah. No, that's good. That's a great, that's, that's actually a great response to it. Cause yeah, it, they are different. And I think a lot of times, like you said, people blur the lines on industrial because it is ever evolving, especially right now with everything that's happening in the retail commerce space. So, mm-hmm. so when you're talking about other brokerage houses, what sets your team apart? Like, what do you feel like, hey, this is our secret sauce. This is what we do really well. What would that be? I mean, where do I even start? <laughs> it's shameless plug time, bro. Yeah. So there, there's really two parts to brokerage. There's the asset valuation and understanding the market piece. And so our team at Blue West Capital is, is highly focused in certain core aspects, whether it be retail, single tenant, you know, class A, B, and C, certain locations. And so they're, they're educated in the process of commercial real estate of, of what is this worth? What's the opportunity of it? What should a client be doing with their equity? And so we can actually you know, be more consultants to people that we're talking with and they find us to be valuable of, you know, what are the options or this tenant is trying to renegotiate an option with us or I've got two partners and we'd want to split up what, you know, what could he buy or what could I buy? And we can really be advisors and almost consultants in the process of a longevity of their commercial real estate. And so we try and really make sure we're 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 knowledgeable and educated in the market and our in our brokerage business. And so that's 50% of it. And the other 50% of a brokerage company is marketing. You know, we want to take somebody's asset to market and let the whole world know about it with all of the emails and phone calls and kind of day to day. We've got a, a shotgun approach, but also a very targeted approach to making sure. We're tracking the right owners. We're, we're looking at the right buyers, the right sellers in the market. Do I know their emails? Do I have their mailing addresses? Am I really making sure that everybody sh- that should know about a property is getting access to it? I mean, we take that very seriously with a shared database, email knowledge of, of everybody that can you know, have certain deals and, and not just spamming our clients, but making sure that if they, if they want to see single tenant deals, at five cap and above at a certain price range in a certain area that we can hit them with it at the right time. And so they don't just get like numb to the email chain and start deleting stuff. So I'd say those two categories are really what we focus on and, and utilize you know, technology as well as good old fashioned phone calling and meeting with people and stuff like that to, to make our brokerage business thrive. No, that's good. And you led me right into my next question was, what is the technology that you're using and why? Yeah. So we use a shared database. We use a company called Real Next. They're great to work with. It allows people to share notes, track emails, you know, market to certain people, make sure that certain people don't get information or called or mailed if they don't want to and, you know, respect their privacy, stuff like that, which when you do have a good deal, they they haven't blocked your number or unsubscribed your mailing list to make sure that they're getting the information that they should. Uh, kind of a unique, the, some of this stuff is, is kind of creepy the more you dig into it, but we use a company called Placer AI that, that tracks foot traffic to retailers with their cell phones. And they've got like 25 million devices throughout the country. And it looks at how long people are going to certain areas where they're coming from and where they're going. And so you can help people with asset management understand what's the trade area of a certain shopping center, where are the consumers coming from to that shopping center? Where are they going to after what, you know, if if they're always coming from a certain shopping center that your shopping center is missing that amenity, like a, 
you know, a food use or a service use or a gym or something where, you know, that might be a good synergy to add to your center to, to stop getting people to leave and going somewhere else. And we help people figure out, you know, is, is there room to push rents or add different tenants and really kind of create the value for their property through a tool like place or AI. Love it. Love it, man. So this is a question and I missed it earlier. I want to go back to it. How do you value a commercial property? Do you just take NOI and base it on the you know, cap rates of the market? That's just a quick back of, back of the napkin. Yeah, I mean, the, so take, taking cap rate and looking at, at comps is kind of a, a method of looking backwards. And so we'll definitely try and, try and peg the asset to the market. If it's kind of fully stabilized down the fairway, you know, cap rate is is a very easy way to come up with a valuation. Now, you know, as a broker, just as the stock market's typically valued like six to 12 months in advance, you want to take that into consideration a little bit of, you know, not only what a deal's been selling for in the past, but what is kind of the opportunity in the future? And, and should I compress the cap rate a little bit? Should I add some vacancy factor in? Should I not? And get a little bit more dynamic. And that's kind of where the 10 year cash flows come in. Mm-hmm. And you can start to solve a little bit for what a typical investor might want from an IRR or an internal rate of return, which kind of looks at not only if they're paying a six cap for it today, but if I think you can push the rental rates on the property 25% over the next three years, I might compress that down to a five cap or a five and a half cap, kind of meet in the middle to still create some market demand. But if somebody's going to be able to sell it for a six or a six and a half in 10 years, and they've pushed the rents considerably further than they would in a normal deal, that should be priced into your underwriting at the beginning. Or conversely, if you've got a, a single tenant deal that's got 12 months left on the lease, and you know it could be vacant or it's a 50-50 probability and the seller just wants to dump it, you got to say, okay, well, what, what's it going to take to release this? What's that rental rate look like? And then price it appropriately. Even though there'll be a cap rate in front of it, it's more about what's that property worth in three to four years versus what it is today. So, you know, cap rate's a good, great place to start. Sales comps is a good place to start, but you should also be looking into the future to figure out kind of what's the opportunity and how's that going to affect the value. Yeah. And that's why having a really good, competent broker is so important for sure. Yeah. What do you see as the biggest opportunity in our industry over the next 12 to 24 months? Like what's that, what's that kind of, Hey, people aren't thinking about this. This is, this is coming up or this could be a big opportunity. I think locking in cheap financing is a big opportunity. It seems so normal now that everybody underwrites deals with 3%, 3.5%, 4% debt. You know, when I started the industry, we were underwriting stuff at six and a half. People 10 years older for me that were underwriting stuff at nine, 10, 11 percent interest. And so, kind of back to that cap rate question, the traditional spread of debt to cap rate is about 150 basis points. And right now it's like 200, 250 basis points. So, debt's on sale. So, yep. I'd say a huge opportunity is just locking in good long term debt. Be careful of your prepays and if you're doing agency debt defeasance and stuff like that. But if you're with the right lender, it can be hugely beneficial to your property. If you haven't refinanced in the last two years, call your mortgage broker or call your lender and Today, talk about right. it with them. <laughs> Lenders are even doing modifications where you don't even have to refinance. They'll just drop your rate to the market rent so they don't lose the loan. We've seen a lot of clients do that. We've helped a lot of clients do that kind of stuff. And I think the, the biggest opportunity in outside of debt is just underutilized properties as demographics continue to shift, populations continue to grow, people are moving to Dallas, people are moving to Denver. You know, commercial real estate is slow to adapt. They either have long-term leases or an owner user building that's been occupying a a class A corner for a long time. So we've got an investor group that we work pretty hard with that likes to identify class A locations with C uses, as we call them. And so they've got the underlying fundamentals of good real estate, good location, visibility, parking lot. 
but for whatever reason, the use isn't at market anymore. Maybe they signed the lease 20 years ago. Maybe it's a, you know, an auto body shop that should be something else or, you know, a pawn shop or a, an office building that should now be a retail location, an industrial building that should be retail, retail that should be apartment, something that's got a great location that should need a different use. And I think that's a great place to find value in commercial real estate. Love it. Yeah, man, that's cool. Especially with just the density in urban areas and everything that's happening for sure. Yeah. So I have on here is question is the book you recommend or the, the real estate concept you couldn't run your business without. And you said, why well, let you answer it. What would that be? What's the difference? There it is. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of great books. I think, you know, favorite book is a tough, a tough question to, to ask. You think you opened up with a pretty good quote regarding the value of a book. And so I'd be interested to hear, hear what your favorite book is at the end of my answer. But relative to this podcast, Never Split the Difference talks a lot about the way people negotiate and why. And I think we often get into this kind of tit for tat. I want a million, you want to offer 800. You know, let's just meet at 900. And, you know, it's a tough way to go into any real estate negotiation. And I think the more educated and ammo you have about your stance or position on value, the better you'll do your client. And so just advising somebody to to meet in the middle or, or come off your price without any reason is a dangerous place to negotiate from. And there might be a certain reason like you went under contract and the pandemic happened and you know certain concessions need to happen and things change which is fine but there's also times where you know economic conditions change and people shouldn't change their price and so just just negotiate to split the difference is a is a lose lose not a win win and i think that book goes into a lot of details and gives some great specific examples of of tactics and tools to use for people to consider when negotiating love it yeah, my what book do you have? What book should I read? Yeah, I got a couple, man. You know, Robert Kiyosaki's big for me, but you know, he's got a new one out. Why the rich get richer? Okay, you need to check that one out. Another one is Deep Work by Kyle Newport. Yeah, you're gonna love that book. He's a professor, and obviously, I won't spoil it. But Deep Work's a great one. Traction. Have you read Traction by Gino Wickman? No, you need to get that one. That one will really help you with running your own brokerage and just a lot of our, you know, you know, my wife and I own 21 companies. So we set a lot of them up on uh, EOS. It's Entrepreneur Operating System. Yeah. Yeah. So he's got he's got a five book series, but the main one is Traction. And so, yeah. And, and then Rocket Fuel is his other one. I would read that one. All right. And, and, then, and then the other book I just read is think, Thinking and Bets. Have uh, you ever heard of that one? No. What is it? Thinking and bets. Thinking invest. In bets. B E T S. Thinking and best. Love it. Man, I appreciate your time, bro. What's your final thoughts for our listeners? And then where can they find you if they want to look you up, man, and reach out to you? What's the final thoughts? And then how can people find you? My final thoughts are real estate's a fun place to be. There's a ton of opportunity. No deal's perfect, right? Risk come as per, part of commercial real estate, it's not a bond. And so you know, a lot of people get into the weeds of, oh, this isn't a good deal because of that, or this isn't a good deal because, because of this risk. And you just kind of need to sensitize your underwriting or your model to figure out, okay, if this happens, then what happens? Or if this happens, how am I going to deal with it? You know, you don't want to jump into a bad deal, but, but starting the process, I think, is, is the most key part. If anybody wants to find me, Blue West Capital is my company. Tom Ethington's my name. All my contact information is on our website. At least it better be. Otherwise, we got some serious problems. <laughs> and you know, email me or you know, reach out. I'm happy to answer any questions on or offline. Sweet man. Thank you again for being on the show, bro. It was great to connect. And like I said, man, thank you for your hard work on that deal we did together. And hopefully we do more. Perfect. I will appreciate answering all the questions. I wish I would have heard more from you, Terrence, but we'll have to connect next time and appreciate the time and all the questions. So thank you very much. 
Yeah, man, I want to feature you, man. We'll connect soon, and and I'll do all the talking when we when we jump on the phone call. But yeah, I, I really want to feature you, brother. It was a lot of great insight on the commercial space. Thank you, thank you so much. Absolutely, anytime. See, see you, bro. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode of The Real Estate Entrepreneur with Terrence Murphy. Please subscribe on whichever platform you are listening and consider leaving a five-star review as that will help us gain traction and continue to bring you knowledge in the real estate industry. For more content, head over to terrencemurphy.com.